Hi, this is Planet Wayne, and this is a quick video on how to create the color coded access system uh, using a programmable Rednet controller uh, that's a part of the Attack of the B Team mod pack. Now, this was created um, as a bit of a follow on, really, from uh, Pungent and Chimney Swiss video. Um, if you've been watching their series, they've recently been uh, creating a bank down on Flim Flam Street. Uh, and I actually thought we could do uh, something a little different when it comes to accessing the vault at the back of the bank there. Um, now the whole thing here is built using um, the um, uh, Redneck cable. Uh, we've got Redneck cable just around in a bit of a grid. Uh, we've got obviously buttons on the front there so you can select the colours. And obviously if you get the colours in the right sequence, um, the door opens up that we've got here on the left hand side. Now that's actually created using uh, drawbridge blocks um, just in the, in the roof space there and across the floor. Uh, and then we've also got these illuminated blocks uh, and such like on here just to show you whether it's, uh, whether it's activated or not. Although to be perfectly fair, it's a door, you're going to see when the door is open. But um, if you ever wanted to use something like this to uh, control access to a piece of machinery or, uh, or as a remote control pad for example, then uh, this, this is a good way of uh, being able to show you whether it's activated or not. Now the buttons that I'm using on here are the uh, Project Red Illumination buttons. Um, and as you can see, they can light up um, to show you that uh, they've actually been activated. Now, typically, if you were building this for real, um, you probably wouldn't want to use that because um, obviously if somebody's standing behind you, they can uh, typically watch over your shoulder, for example, and just see what uh, what order that you're uh, pressing the buttons in there. So uh, again, standard stone buttons or uh, wooden buttons would work just as well. Um, these are just been used just for the purpose of this video, just to show you what's going on a little clearer. Now the actual uh, frame here is all uh, built up using um, micro blocks. Um, we've got the face blocks that are on there um, that are again just covering over the cable and then we've got these edge strips as you can see just around the edges of the uh, of the buttons just to, uh, to fill in the gaps there. Uh, if I just break a few of these away you can see all that we've got behind here is uh, just straight redneck cable. Um, literally as you put all of these buttons together it'll just form one big massive grid in the background there um, and that's all we've got there just to um, to provide all of that so a uh, fairly simple design um, as with all of these things the tricks actually in the coding um, so what I'll do is we'll go through how the coding works um, and I'll just show you a few more examples of uh, how this thing looks without actually uh, any of the bank or vault uh, section built around it there I'm standing in front of the debug build uh, that I built for the whole of this thing. Um, and literally, we're not going to go into the code of how this bit actually works, but um, it was it was basically to demonstrate the logic of how the final uh, coding works for the, uh, for the controller that we're using. Um, now this one's actually hooked up, as you can see, to this uh, seven segment display behind. We've also got this stack of lamps over to the left hand side, as well as our uh, entry exit indicators and such on this, uh, on this final stack. Um, and again, we've got the same um, configuration for the uh, keypad that we've got built. Um, now, I don't know if you ever know, uh, if you ever stack a uh, redneck cable together, um, it naturally forms a grid anyway as you start to build the whole thing up. So uh, an ideal uh, starting point really when, you, when you're doing something like this keypad. Um, and it's literally just the action of putting a button in front of the cable um, that produces this connection pad. Um, which fills in the rest of the space then around that uh, around that button. Then typically the only thing that you need to worry about then is just adjusting each of the colours on each of the positions to um, a unique uh, colour in, in the sequence um, just so you've got the ability to um, select different colours as part of your uh, combination and so on. So uh, real simple on that one. Again I'm just using this uh, precision sledgehammer to uh, change the, uh, the colours. Uh, and again, you can either cycle forwards or if you hold the shift key down um, and crouch uh, click, um, it'll cycle backwards through the colors again there. Um, and as you can see, typically without anything um, on that, we've got these gaps in between, in between the cables there or in between the buttons. Uh, and again, that's filled in using these uh, uh, strips that we've got created using the uh, micro blocks. Uh, and again, just going along, just filling in the uh, the gaps around there, just to uh, to take that away. So the actual keypad, pretty simple build. Oops, one too many. Pretty simple build on that. Um, and as I say, just literally going behind behind the cable, exactly the same thing again. Just putting buttons in front of the cable is enough to put that pad there that we can then code up 
um, and use um, for our keypad there. Now the only other thing to mention with this, as I say we've got this stack of, of lamps here um, and that's to show me um, when I was creating this at what section we are through the code and whether it's been accepted or not. So one of the key things with this is a counter that's inside this um, and we're actually using that to um, to detect what position we are in our sequence against the button that we're pressing. So one thing that we need to have is a reset button to make sure this counter gets reset. Um, and again, with that one, I've got that set on pink here. Um, as you're clicking through, actually, it's only a five button sequence anyway. So eventually you'll get to the end of the sequence um, and it will reset naturally back to zero. But um, having that reset button in there gives us the ability to, 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 to know where we are in that sequence without having to sort of keep retrying the code. Uh, and so on each time round because typically what you're not going to know is if somebody's come up to your keypad and started randomly pressing on buttons hoping to crack the code so as I say having that reset button that takes us back to that zero position then gives us the ability to say okay we're at position zero now we can start our code off um, and on this code um, we start off with white that's lit that first lamp there uh, the second one is orange then we've got blue green and then back to white again for the final number in the sequence. And again, that's opened that lamp up there or illuminated that lamp to say that the door's gonna be open. Um, now again, with this, if you get a button out of sequence, it's enough to reset the whole thing. So if somebody part gets a code uh, and then gets the next one wrong, it's gonna throw that counter position off. So even trying to come back and think, okay, I wanna start, well, I know that the next one's supposed to be blue, for example, it won't take it any further. And then by the time you start carrying on with that, it's going to get to the end and that's just going to reset the whole thing anyway. So getting lamps out of position or buttons out of position is not going to do anything to, uh, to try and get past this code. You have to start from position zero and you have to get all five lamps or all five buttons in the correct order for it to activate at the end there. Again, typically as you would expect from a normal combination lock. Okay, before we get too deep into the uh, programming code for this, I just wanted to have a quick mention about buttons that we're using. Um, if you remember from our original layout over there, we're actually using these uh, Project Red Illumination buttons here uh, on front of the uh, pads that we can see behind that shows us the uh, color for the button that we're pressing. Um, now, the one problem with those as a standard button, um, they've actually got the same amount of delay as a standard Minecraft button, which is about a second for a stone button. Um, now, one thing to be mindful of is when you're pressing a button as you're going through the code, you need to wait for the button to become deactivated or to pop back up again before you hit the next button in the sequence. If you try and get it any quicker than that or overlap any of the buttons, then the uh, controller doesn't actually register the fact that you've uh, pressed the next button in the sequence and it throws the whole thing out. So the only way to get around that is to... Um, or you'll see by the time you get to the end of the sequence that the door won't open is to actually hit your reset button and then start the whole thing again. Now there is a way around that by using these uh, big buttons from the open blocks mod. Um, and as you can see here I've got one mounted in front of the uh, redneck cable but as you can also see we can't see the coloured pad that's surrounding these normal smaller buttons. Um, and again if I mount one of those buttons onto that uh, cable there you can see that the connection pads appeared behind it and I can see that I've changed a color on there and such like but I just can't see what that color is on the front of the button um, the also the, the other thing is is typically is if you try and infill with uh, strips and such like around the edge it doesn't actually take to uh, the gaps there it's just too small for um, for it to be infilled so uh, again we can't use um, can't use any of those to uh, to do that um, but the uh, bonus with this is typically obviously the button press is a heck of a lot quicker than a standard button uh, as you can see from that here now in fact that actual button press is too quick for the rednet controller to pick up on um, so what we end up having to do is uh, actually lengthening that button press uh, a little bit in itself um, now the way that you do that is if you right click or crouch right click with an empty hand you actually get into the interface then of the button and you can see we've got this slot here for putting stackable blocks in there. So the idea being is the more stackable blocks that you put in 
um, the the longer the delay or the longer the button stays on for. So here we've got one that I've just put nine blocks in there. Um, if I click on that, you can hear the difference between that one and this one that hasn't got anything in there. Um, now what I found with that one is that's um, too long and that one's obviously too short. So the happy media that I got to with this is on this example that we've got here is each of these buttons has got two blocks uh, in there to just give it enough length for the controller um, to be able to pick up on the fact that you've pressed the button. Um, and as you can also see from this design is each of these buttons are now mounted onto uh, coloured wool um, which gives us our colour patterns that we can use to build up the code with. So this controller here is using exactly the same code that we've got running over there. Um, the wiring's pretty much the same as well. So we've got the uh, drawbridge block on the top here as well as our indicators to show what's going on with the, uh, with the door. Uh, and again, if I just hit the sequence of buttons, that's about as quick as I can move my mouse between each of the buttons there to, uh, for it to register each of the clicks. So um, yeah, if you're after speed, obviously use the big buttons. Um, the downside being is you're gonna have to use a different block behind it um, to do the color combinations on. Um, but that also means as well that the complete thickness of the wall is now another two blocks wider. Um, so three blocks in total um, over our original design because we need to allow the space for this block to, uh, to connect, this uh, colored block to connect uh, onto the red net cable behind there. Um, so again, just needed to point that out just to uh, show you the difference there between the uh, speeds of the buttons and such like when you're putting these things together. I'm actually underneath the vault now, uh, and as you can see there's our programmable Rednet controller um, that's got three expansion slots in there to cope with the amount of code that we've got in the, uh, in the programming of this. Now we've actually got, uh, we're actually making use of 19 programming slots, and to get there I've got um, two LX500s uh, and one LX300 which gives us all of the slots that we need to do this. Uh, we're also making a use or a lot of use of variables as well throughout of all of this to uh, to tie everything together. So again with those combinations of cards um, that's the minimum that we need to uh, to get this to work. Um, now the wiring as I said before is very simple we've just got one piece of cable that's coming out of the, the upper face on the controller uh, and that's pretty much connected to everything um, as you can see just looking up from there there's the bottom of the keypad um, which is on both sides obviously for inside and outside of the building um, there's some connections on this edge um, I don't know if you can just about see it just about there that are activating the the lamps um, and again they're on the black channel on there uh, and again underneath we've got these uh, drawbridge uh, blocks which uh, activate the door there uh, and again they're all on the black channel uh, again on this upper face um, real simple wiring job um, this cable extends all the way up and across the top as well to pick up some three uh, three more drawbridge uh, blocks again up to you whether you want it to come in from the top and the bottom I just thought it looked a bit more interesting to do the both um, but uh, yeah very simple on the cabling um, and it's just all uh, just a case of bringing all of that into the top face of the uh, controller, um, certainly with the code that we're using here. Obviously, if you decide to change the way that the uh, thing's connected because you want to move the controller somewhere else, uh, just adjust each of the uh, coding lines accordingly to uh, bring it in on that face that you've got the uh, red net cable connected to there. We're here in the programming interface of the uh, Rednet controller uh, and as I said previously we're using 19 slots now to uh, to hold all the code for this. Um, now as I'm skipping through this um, each of the sections are bro uh, broken down into different areas to do various different uh, functions and such. Um, so um, you'll start to hopefully see some pattern as we're going through the code with this. Now the first uh, thing that we need to do is actually detect the fact that we're pressing a button so we can increase the counters that we're using uh, later on through the programming stage. And the way that we're doing that one is um, we're actually making use of a four input OR gate on this first slot um, and putting the output from that into variable zero. So quite simply um, from this we've got all the I.O. is coming from the upper face so no need to worry about back left right or, or upper or lower or anything to that degree. Everything's all coming in through the upper face and we're taking the first four colours off, uh, off our keypad that we've got. Um, so from there we've got a four, as I said before, a four input OR gate. Uh, we're taking white, orange, magenta and light blue and we're pushing the output of that into variable zero. 
the next slot we're taking the uh, input from variable zero if it's been set already uh, and again pushing that through another four input or gate and this time picking up three more colors off our keypad so again all these are io lines uh, and now we're picking up yellow light green and pink uh, off the keypad as well and again registering that as an output into variable zero so the idea behind behind that is typically if uh, if variable zero has already been set then it'll carry on being set because it's an input on this or function as well so if it got set on the first uh, programming slot it'll remain set as it as it goes through this function uh, and then comes out into this last one that we've got here which is a three input or function which is picking up the remaining two colors off our uh, off our keypad uh, and again we're also taking input from variable zero so if it's set we're keeping it set um, but as well we're also picking up on the fact that we've now pressed um, either the dark grey or the light grey button um, up top there on the keypad. So any one of those buttons is going to register a value in variable zero uh, and that's what we're basically doing in the first three programming slots is just picking up on the fact that we have pressed a button. Um, and again that's going to be used a bit later on in the counter to uh, increase on the value that we've got so we know what position we are in the code that we're in, that we're trying to input there here in slot four um, this is our counter that works out which position that we're in in the code that we're uh, inputting on the uh, keypad um, and now it's nothing really overly complex um, it's literally just a counter uh, we're increasing the value that the counter holds with the input from variable zero so effectively we press a button the counter goes up by one uh, we're not decreasing the values by anything so that's just set to a constant value of zero and we're telling the counter that it's got a maximum of six counts before it resets itself uh, or before it latches back over again to, to zero so effectively we're going naught through five as soon as we get to a six uh, if somebody presses a button then the counter automatically trips back over to um, to zero again uh, and that's where that's set here so if you ever needed to increase or decrease the uh, amount of uh, buttons that you're using to set a code then you need to make sure that as well as increasing the slots a bit later on um, that we've got that value set to the correct number of uh, digits that you want to use in your code or the correct number of colors that you want to use in your code sequence now again one thing to be mindful on this um, we said before that we're using pink as our reset button uh, and this is where this resets that counter so the reset IO on this one is set to the upper face on the pink channel um, so if anybody hits that pink button that resets that counter straight back down to zero so we can start our sequence off again from scratch now the output from this counter is being pushed out into variable one and we'll use that a lot later on to uh, compare against positions and such like that we're on as we're pressing buttons um, but uh, that's where that gets set from there uh, just to make sure that that's set in that variable now the other thing just to be mindful of is these counters also will trip over and set this Q value whenever it reaches the maximum number in the count so if somebody sat there randomly uh, pressing buttons on your keypad and such like instead of the counter just sort of uh, whizzing off over the top and just sort of losing itself and carrying on um, as soon as it gets set to um, to the to that sixth value or to to uh, to value five on there it'll reset itself back down to zero but it'll also set this io channel uh, again on the pink uh, io channel here and that gets used again a lot through um, the rest of the uh, programming functions to reset all the latches that we're using to uh, record our memory states the fact that we press the right buttons and such like in the correct order um, so that's what we've got going on with that looks a little bit strange in the fact that we're using pink um, a couple of times on here to do a few things uh, but hopefully it'll become clear as we start to go through the rest of the code there the next three slots are used to decode position one or the first color that we've got in our code sequence um, now if you can remember from the example right at the very beginning we're actually using white as our first input button um, now we're, we're ignoring reset for the minute but I'll get onto that as we start to uh, to use those colors a bit later on but uh, basically our uh, comparison or the way that we're checking for that is we're going to need to check against the counter to see what position that we are in the code against uh, making sure that we're pressing the right button for the position that we're at and then if those are both correct then we're using the output from that to actually set a latch which stays set uh, until we get through to the end of the code or a reset uh, uh, event happens so the way that we're doing that is uh, on slot 5 here we've got a simple equals comparison 
uh, and the way that that works is it's simply going to compare the values that's in the A and the B slots here and set an output and the um, output slot or the Q slot here uh, depending on if they're if they're the same. So uh, the value that we're checking for in the A slot is a constant value of one. Um, and we're checking that against the output of the counter, which as you remember is in variable one. So if we're at position one on the counter, then that's going to set variable two here on the output of this equals, which then gets used in the next comparison, which is a two input and gate, which again, make sure that variable two is set um, and checks it against the uh, first button in our key sequence, which is on our white channel. So if you wanted to change this up to uh, have different colors, and I strongly suggest you do, um, then um, obviously changing the color that we've got here is going to be uh, the first color that we need to check for in the sequence of events there. So in this case, we're pressing the white button we're making sure that we're at position one because we've got variable two set and then the output from that is going into variable three and that then gets used in the next sequence which is the SR latch. Now brief explanation of an SR latch, anytime an SR latch gets set it'll remain set until a reset event happens. So we're setting an SR latch with the content of variable three that'll stay set until the IO line or the upper face pink channel um, gets pressed or is, is set from the counter. So if you remember, we're actually using that as the output from, um, the, uh, from the counter if it actually gets through to the uh, maximum number of counts that it's allowed to do. Um, so once that's happened, uh, as soon as variable three gets set, SR latch gets set as, as permanently on and subsequently the output from that in the Q output here gets pushed into variable four. And it's those three sequence of events that we're using that are actually daisy chained together. And you'll see where we're using variable four in the next set of three um, to actually make sure that we're pressing the right buttons in the right order um, until we get right to the very end where we're actually using the output of the latch to actually set or unset the gates um, or the um, the drawbridge blocks that we're using to actually close the gates in front of the doors or you know do the doors or activate the machinery that you're trying to do with this. Um, so that's the sequence of events that we've got on there. As soon as we get on to the next one, this is exactly the same now, but for position two. So again, we've got an equals comparison. We're checking now against um, a constant value of two, but again, the input again is still from variable one, which is the output from the counter. Only this time we're now sticking the output for that into our next free variable, which is variable five. Same thing again, variable five then gets used this time in a three input AND gate because we're as, as well as using variable five, we also want to make sure that variable four is set. So in other words, we've got to have pressed the white button first for variable four to get set based on the uh, SR latch that we've got. And if that's the case and our next input color is orange, then that um, comparison here with this three input AND gate set to variable six. And then variable six, again, you probably guessed it by now, is the thing that sets our next SR latch, which then goes on to set variable seven for the next comparison that we're using. And again, simple thing, we're also using reset, which is coming off our pink IO line uh, on, the, on the upper face um, to reset it if need be. Um, we're setting again on variable six, we're outputting on variable seven. On to the third position. This is now, again, simple equals comparison. We've changed the constant value now to position three or variable three, um, sorry, to value three. And again, we're comparing the output from the counter, which is stored in variable one. And then the output from that gets put into variable eight. Variable eight gets used again in another three input AND gate. Uh, and along with the output from the pre previous position, which is that output from that SR latch, uh, from position two, uh, we've got variable seven, which is that uh, that SR latch. We've got variable eight, which is our position counter that we've just done. And the IO face now is coming in from yellow. So we're pressing effectively the yellow button in position three. Um, and then the output from that is getting pushed into variable nine. And again, next set, set of uh, events or next sequence, we're using variable nine to set the latch to say, yes, we were in the right position at the right time and all of the previous events had happened to set variable 10. 
So again, we're repeating this as we're going through the rest of the uh, code on this, uh, and there's only a few more slots left to do, um, but it's all following the same sort of pattern. As you can see, they all start to chain together. Um, so one position is very dependent on the previous position already being set correctly. Um, that brings us on to slot 14, which again is another equals comparison. So we're now uh, comparing for position four. So as long as the output from the counter, which is variable one, is uh, equal to four, then that sets um, value or variable 11 there, uh, which is ready on the next comparison that we've now got again, three input AND gate, um, which checks variable 10 to make sure our previous button was set correctly. Uh, variable 11 to make sure that we've just pressed the right button and now we've got the upper uh, upper channel on the um, grey button effectively for our next button press. Once all that's set the output from that is going into variable 12 which again is being used to set another latch to say that we've got that button position correct uh, and then the output from that uh, is going into variable 13 and again, as we've been doing with all of these so far, we've also got a reset that's coming in from the upper face on the pink channel. So again, if pink gets pressed for any reason, that resets all of these latches back down to zero, so you have to start the whole sequence again from the beginning. So again, point to remember on that one. The fifth slot that we're comparing against, or the fifth digit that we're comparing, um, is done, or the sequence for that starts on slot 17. So again, same sort of sequence of events, We've got a constant value on this equals comparison from uh, of a value five, and that's being compared again against the output from the counter, um, and the output from that is being pushed into variable 14. Variable 14 gets used against this, uh, or one of the inputs is this uh, three input AND gate, along with the output from the previous slot, which was in variable 13. So we've got 13, variable 13, variable 14, and this time IO face white channel um, for our fifth uh, button press here. Uh, and then the output from that one goes into variable 15, which we're using in our last programming slot, which again is an SR latch, but we're using it in a slightly different fashion. We've still got the reset that's coming in from the pink face, and we're still setting it based on the input from variable 15. Only this time, instead of it getting, um, instead of the output going into a variable, we don't need to do that anymore. We actually need to send that out on a channel to be able to activate the drawbridge blocks. Um, now, because the drawbridge blocks work in reverse effectively, or they need a redstone signal to um, to push the block out, um, then we're actually using the inverted output on here. So whenever variable 15 is set high then that's being inverted from this SR latch output um, to set the upper face on the black channel um, to be the opposite. So if 15 is on, then the IO channel uh, on the black face is, is set to off, which effectively uh, pulls in or deactivates the, um, the drawbridge. So if effectively it'll retract all of the blocks that you've got set in that drawbridge. So when you get the code correct, it opens the door. Um, and that's really that. Uh, we don't need to latch that or put that into any other variables, or at least not with this uh, example. Um, if you're using any machinery that does require a positive output to uh, to activate, then use the Q output on here uh, rather than this inverted output. Um, it's really the fact that those drawbridge blocks um, require a signal to push the blocks out, and it's the opposite that we're trying to do because we're actually opening a door. So hence the fact that we're using that inverted output there. Um, but that's basically it. Um, as I said before, there's uh, sections of code that you can repeat if you need to increase the uh, number of uh, digits that you're using, or the number of colors, I should say, that you want in your code. Um, and there you go. Okay, that's it for me, Planet Wayne. Um, hopefully you enjoy this video on uh, how to make the uh, coded entry exit system there. Um, again, likes and feedbacks are most welcome in the comments below. Um, and uh, that's it for now, and I shall uh, see you in the next one. Thanks a lot, and bye for now.